All right, what's up, everybody? We're here in the studio in good old Wisconsin, Barneville, USA. Uh, and we're here to talk about guns, which everybody loves. Uh, and we've got Nick Loffenberg across the table from Mark and myself. And what we've done is we've embarked on a journey that probably Mark and myself never thought we'd actually do here. Not a million years, Jim. The order of operations of this, too, by the way, you know, this is a pod venture. What hasn't COVID screwed up? Uh, if we wind up repeating ourselves a little bit, we actually intended to do this episode before we went down to Missouri to meet with a guy named Isaiah Curtis to build Mark's super Gucci awesome custom rifle. Uh, we were going to then talk about the rifle that I built with Nick, which is more of your quote unquote entry level. Uh, precision custom rifle. Uh, but, you know, I mean, just with uh, traveling and timing and this, that, and the other thing, it ended up being that we're recording this one afterwards. So, again, if you listen to that one and a couple of things we say here get repeated, I don't know. Now you just got sure. it double times put into your head and you're knocking. Yeah, it's uh, all about impressions, Jim. You know, yeah. you don't learn things just the first time. We gave you double the reason in that case or double the things to think about uh, to hopefully get you on track to building your own custom long-range rifle. Um, but here we are. So let's, let's get into, uh, why we did what we did though. That is one thing that we didn't quite fully address there. Uh, the idea here was that, uh, we wanted to kind of do a little bit of a, uh, I guess, super Gucci high end Mm -hmm. versus, yeah, you're more, uh, again, like we said, entry level, I guess, uh, all relative, all relative, yeah. and, uh, and, and more, just of a D- more of a DIY. Yeah, a little bit more DIY that we had with this. Um, certainly, Nick and I weren't, you know, when we built this rifle, we weren't cutting the barrel or doing any of that stuff, but we did get parts and put it together, similarly to how someone would maybe get parts and put an AR-15 together. Um, not something you hear nearly as many people do with bolt guns as they do with ARs, Correct. it seems, which is kind of interesting because we'll get into it a little bit when we put this together. Once you finally figure out the order of operations and directions <laughs> and things, it's actually relatively simple to put yeah. together, similarly yeah. to an AR-15. Um, so that was pretty neat. But we wanted to kind of do this comparison and see what you get for the extra money that would go into the custom route where you send it off to a gunsmith and essentially all the work is done for you and what's sent back is just this epitome of perfection. Um, which we can all pretty much agree that is what Mark's rifle turned out a lot like. Yeah, I should have awesome. brought it in here, it's sitting at my desk right now. <laughs> no, you shouldn't have, because glowing, it would have upstaged Jim. mine. Right, and I want yeah. mine to take the limelight here for a second. Um, so anyway, that's what we want to talk about, and I think we did find some interesting things, a, a, a little bit you know, that followed what we would have originally anticipated. We certainly didn't think that this gun here with the components that we used um, would shoot poorly, but... I know I was eager to see just how much better, you know, we've discussed that we don't have the exact price breakdown, but we're somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe $2,000 on this rifle. Yeah, it's right in that ballpark. Yeah, and then a rifle similar to what Mark had done is maybe your $6,500 to $7,000 price range. Um, Just was really interested to see sort of how much more you eke out uh, when you go that route. Um, And then, of course, too, you know, time time is money. Time is valuable. Yep. And... Nick and I had to put the time into making this rifle to that point, uh, to the point it's at now. Mark just got the opportunity to have somebody else do it. Yeah, I, I watched somebody else work. Actually, right. well, you guys were there. It was <laughs> awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was really cool, and you yeah. learned a lot. And you know, shooting shooting factory ammo out of this thing, which again, somebody else loaded up for you. That's pretty sweet. You're getting like quarter MOA groups with the uh, easily forty grain yep. ELD match. Yeah, um, we're getting close to that with this gun. Definitely Very. sub. Definitely sub MOA. Um, oh yeah, easy yeah. peasy. Uh, I think this was actually this one when we were all said and done was shooting about. Um, Point three minutes, and Marks was shooting about point two. Yeah. So there was a difference, um, and differences that you'll definitely see down range. In fact, there was one group of Marks that shot like basically zero. It was three shots in the same hole. It was. Um, but the the important thing is is when we look at these both of these rifles comparing side by side, is this right here is a rifle that pe- it, the, a really qualified shooter or a very you know somebody who's going to be in the top 10 using a rifle like this isn't going to take him out of the top 10 um 
this is something that somebody can put together themselves, take to a PRS match, and actually have a piece of equipment that is functioning and, pro- or, and is good enough to be, get the job done. Or, and it's not going to drag them down by yeah. any mm-hmm. means. Um, so as somebody who wants to get into that type of game or have a really high-quality rifle at a price point that you know, I think is appropriate for entry level at that type of game. It's an expensive game anyways, but $2,000, including an optic, a fully ready to go rifle is not much money. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What, what is it about that? Like when you're piecing this together, I remember thinking at first, I'm like, okay, we're going to build, you know, my, my budget long range gun, right. Mm -hmm. You know, custom we'll do, you know, this, this route instead of, instead of going the factory route, which I think we'll get maybe more into, but, I was thinking to myself, you know, ah, yeah, what? Let's try and keep it under a grand. Mm -hmm. And I even watched as you were piecing this together, and you're saying, you know, blue printed Remington 700 action. We'll get this nice uh, Remington barrel for it. You know, you throw a muzzle brake on, you throw a bipod on, a nice stock from uh, or a chassis from KRG, and then an optic on top. I'm like, we should be able to maybe 1200. And then it was 2000 the end, and I realized. That's kind of just the nature of the beast because yeah. nothing, nothing really that we have on here, I would say, is excessive. No, it's definitely nothing excessive. I think some people might see the Arca rail on there and say, well, you could have gone without that or, oh, well, you could have got a true. cheaper bipod. And the fact of the matter is we could. Uh, but I think the goal, at least in my mind, was I wanted to rifle in the completed format that isn't, there's, there's nothing about it that's going to say, well, I should have got that because it's this is going to hinder me. Mm-hmm. Nothing about that's a hindrance. Right. It seems like probably the biggest cost goes into the barrel. Yeah. Uh, a quality guess. barrel, I mean, it's, it's going to come down to tolerances. Um, you know, one thing that we all kind of, I think we reiterated when we were talking with Isaiah was uh, tolerance stacking, um, precise pieces, precise uh building, all those stack up to be um, consistency, and consistency is precision. And and having parts that function in a consistent format requires precision, requires um, a lot more time and energy and effort and better quality materials to make a rifle that performs as well as this does. And this was very consistent, and I think with yours, you shot out at 700 yards, and that was about an inch, inch and a half group. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that was with me shooting. <laughs> right. I mean, let's and remember that, that. I think, I mean, it, it definitely did the job. Now, of course, Mark's rifle is better, and it's nicer, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Mm-hmm. But this is a hell of a rifle for 2000 Yeah. And the really nice thing I thought for me as well is that I have grown accustomed to shooting uh, other rifles that are probably tend to be... I mean, when you talk about entry level, we're talking about in general entry mm-hmm. level, not even just for PRS, NRL, whatever. Um, and so I've gotten used to bolts that are super sticky and they don't feed super well. In fact, I'm very used to guns with bolts that don't feed ammunition very well. I've got uh, <laughs> some pictures of some bloody fingers, I'll tell you that. Um, but anyway, you know, and triggers that get a little bit gritty and mushy and, you know, then ultimate accuracy where you're thinking to yourself, okay, an MOA at a hundred yards, like, I think we can, you know, work with that. Um, I mean, putting this gun together and seeing it perform the way that it did, I was blown away. I was yeah. extra blown away when I saw Mark's, but I was still blown away at, at, at this. And then just the capability of it, there's something about having a rifle, that's so much, I guess, just more accurate. And there's just so much uh, less going on in the rifle that could screw up your shot. Where when you take that shot, it just it's so much more confidence inspiring. Because you think to yourself, confidence if I put the, the crosshairs on it and break the trigger without moving the gun, it should go there. Yeah. And it's just actually, when we were shooting at the smaller targets yesterday, um, that was where I really saw Mark's rifle shine is that we were shooting at targets that were half minute of angle. Mm-hmm. So take out wind for one mm-hmm. and then take out the shooter's abilities. Just the weapon and the ammunition need to be able to perform within a half minute of angle at those given ranges. And Mark's rifle with a decent shooter behind it is able to accomplish that. Um, I missed that last target. And I know that I should have been able to hit it, but I mean, one component that we did not really change from 
what would be considered a factory component is the trigger that's on that Remington 700. And it's an okay trigger, um, but we didn't adjust it down, didn't make any changes there, and it's sitting right around four pounds. That's a lot when you consider Mark's rifle. We had at eight point nine ounces. Yeah, yeah. That was the one component, you know, shooting both Jim's rifle and my rifle that I saw um, a vast difference. Dramatic. Mm-hmm. It was. It and it was and, and and we talked about that. If you get used to a trigger like that, yep. then that's what you're used to. And and we talked a little bit about you know, you kind of um, end up imparting. You know, just more human, more of the yeah. human elephant, or hum, the human elephant. <laughs> <laughs> I knew exactly what you meant. That guy's that guy knows what I'm talking about. I speak, my I new, speak, Mark. Um, that's my new band. <laughs> yeah, the my new band name. You know, when you uh, the human elephant. Um. Anyway, Andy Dwyer would be breaking down the door right now <laughs> to steal that band name <laughs> for any Parks and Rec fans out there. Um. Regardless of my words. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, it was dramatic difference, and and yeah. I think that's a big thing that helped me shoot that other yeah. rifle better was the trigger. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. And in all honesty, you go to the good guys over there, like at Trigger Tech, and you pick up one of their um, even one of their specials, which I think come down to a pound. Um, it's not an awfully expensive trigger, and adding that onto the build, like if this was my rifle and I wanted to change one thing about it, it would 100% be the trigger and I would 100% be putting in a trigger tech special or spending a little bit extra money and getting the diamond trigger like Seth and Mark's. And it's so that's funny. a pretty Gucci trigger, but it it's not that expensive. And the, the change, the level of quality jump that you get by just installing that one little piece of equipment is dramatic. It's so funny because I love this trigger. I know you're nuts. No. <laughs> you're crazy. I, I know. I, like, <laughs> there's something about getting behind a gun, and I know it's a matter of just getting used to things because the human brain and body and all your kinetics and everything can get used to anything. But right now, I'm like six years off of shooting a Ruger American Predator, <laughs> which is a fine rifle as it sits. But my trigger, and I actually do really enjoy that particular trigger, but I guess that's the thing, is a lot of people would say, you know, oh my gosh, you like that? But it's just what I've been used to, right? Like, I know exactly when that trigger's going to break. As I... I'm pulling the blade back, and I can kind of get my finger there, preload it a little bit, and then I feel this little, like, tick, and I don't know what that is, but then all of a sudden <laughs> I know immediately after, <laughs> immediately after that, click, it's going to break. And I think they call that creep. <laughs> sure. I, if you want to uh, put... <laughs> Like uh, what are they? If you want to put uh, sauce on a pancake, sauce on a pancake. <laughs> human sure. elephant sure. labels. That's what I say. If you want to put labels oh, okay. on it. Oh boy. Okay. Well. Anyway, I don't but think we do that but I, That's what Jim. I've gotten used to. And yeah. so I remember, you know, the first time I got behind a gun with this really light trigger, I just went to rest my finger on it, you know, because it's just kind of like, okay, you know, and of course we're pointing things in the safe directions, right? Yep. You're, you're, you're about ready to shoot by the time your finger goes on the trigger. But all I did was rest my finger on it. I'm, I'm now going from the point where, okay, the target is in the crosshairs and I'm about there to now like, all right, I'm going to do my fine tuning. Finger goes on the trigger, bang, and yeah. went off. And it, oh, I can't do that. Well, Nick, would you say like when you get to know a trigger, right, or you're like your your trigger press process is going to be different for maybe each trigger? Well, yeah. I mean, definitely how you approach the trigger, um, whether you can rest your finger on it or whether you know that when your finger comes into contact with it, any pressure is going to set it off. Um, but it's, it's really familiarizing you with that piece of equipment. Like that um, in Jim's gun, when I got behind that, I closed the bolt and got on target and I started squeezing the trigger and I stopped myself and checked to see if I had the safety on. Right. And I did it again, walked through the process, and I checked again, did I turn off the safety? Just because I'm <laughs> so far away from using that heavy of a trigger. Yeah. Now, you're fairly used to it. Um, the trigger in my competition rifles is set between 8 and 10 ounces. Um, I have 10 ounce in my training rifle, and I have 8 ounces in my uh, primary match rifle. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, Mark's was set at, you know, 8.9. But then on an extreme contrast, you know, we got behind Isaiah's uh, Six Comet for a little while. And he's got his set. I believe he said at that one was four ounces. Maybe it was three ounces. Three said three. Three ounces. And he said, you know, he's so familiar with that trigger that it actually feels heavy to him. 
No. That seems impossible. That's like saying, oh, this helium is just right. really oh, weighing me down. You can't even lift it. But if you put thousands of rounds on a rifle with that trigger, he said that one action has, has over 40,000 documented rounds on that action. I mean, he's probably had a four-ounce trigger or a three-ounce trigger on that action for that long. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> he's just used to it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean acclimating yourself to something like that is important. I, I do not recommend anybody who is unfamiliar or less experienced with that type of trigger go and buy and crank it down to four ounces because right. you, you are causing a somewhat dangerous uh, dangerous situation for somebody who's less experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, somebody who's less experienced, like I said, at least the rifle was pointed the right direction for correct. me. Correct, yeah. Know, and it was just missing by like a foot off the right shoulder of an Ipsic target at 700 yards. But yeah, if you're not if you're not aware at all, and the gun is still resting on its buttstock, pointed up slightly, and you get behind, and a finger accidentally goes somewhere it shouldn't go. And Absolutely, that that's one thing where I do see um, if you're if you're you know using an unfamiliar rifle, or your buddy says, "Hey, shoot this," man, dry fire it a couple times. Yes. Absolutely, you know, get it, in, you know, obviously point it in a safe direction and dry fire, it and get a feel for how that trigger is going to break. And I'm no obviously no pro PRS shooter like you are, Nick, but I know that's one thing that <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry, helps I laughed me at out that. a lot. I suck. <laughs> no, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't do that with your gun. I literally just got behind it, loaded it up, and started shooting, and the problem was that then then I went and you know, I rested my finger on it. Like I said, it went off. It surprised me, but mm-hmm. there's so much of like a big kaboom when it goes off, right? And you're not ready for it, so you, you kind of flinch a little bit, and I wasn't even able to figure out like how much pressure I actually even put. Right. Right. So yeah. the next I, I didn't I didn't think to dry fire, right? So I just was like, keep shooting, right? That's always a good answer. That'll fix uh, that, just that'll fix just about anything. anything. Keep digging that <laughs> hole. So of course I load up another one. And I'm like, man, what the heck happened there? I guess this thing's really light. And I tried to do it again, but it surprised me again. And I just never could figure it out because every time that the trigger went, an explosion happened, and I wasn't ready for said explosion. Yeah. And so then, had I have just dry fired it a couple times, which I did with that six comet at three ounces, I actually didn't shoot very well with your gun, and I shot well with the six comet. I think because I dry fired it enough times, I was like, "Yeah, got it." That's for what it. I have to do. You well, know, should... not necessarily like punching the trigger, like, "Okay, I'm ready for it to go now." You know, you're you're, but you do have some idea of when the trigger is going to break. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that helps. I mean, Eric. You know, I walked in the in the shop this morning. Eric's like, "You gotta let me see that thing," because you know they'd been hearing about this, you know, this wonderful work of art rifle that we uh, built with Isaiah the other day, and and uh, I felt like I'd set a trap. He's like, "Oh, I'm, can I feel the trigger?" I'm like, "Yeah, I feel the trigger," you know. And I'm like, almost like laying in wait because I know Eric is familiar, you know, like predominantly, you know, hunting rifles and a little bit heavier trigger. And I was just like waiting for him to test it out and he's like oh my god <laughs> like you know it's yeah. shocking it's actually yeah. shocking how it light is. it is anytime i take my my competition rifles to like a training class or something like that and somebody wants to shoot my gun i will always take that magazine out open the bolt and say dry fired a few times because mm-hmm. every time somebody gets behind one of my rifles even though i don't have my set at the, the extreme limits uh, every time that f- person's first thing was oh what that went off a lot faster than i was mm-hmm. expecting yep. and it's always better to have that little bit of surprise before they have rounds in the chamber. Yep. Yeah, get that out of the way uh, yeah. before something's going down range. Yeah. yeah. Now, as far as, so getting back into what, you know, okay, again, maybe this podcast is geared towards somebody who's looking into getting into the yeah. PRS game, the L, you know NRL, whatever, some sort of precision long range competition. Um, let's, let's discuss factory guns, yeah. okay? Mm-hmm. Because that's not what this would be considered. You even made that point clear before we started on this. There is factory divisions within, you know, uh, certain competitive spheres, where this gun wouldn't qualify because this is a custom gun, right? Yep. Uh, factory divisions, hopefully, you know, for uh, for those out there, it's a great way to level the playing field. You get, you know, everybody's using something that was off the shelf. Um, and there are plenty of accurate off-the-shelf guns. I know oh, yeah. plenty of guys here with guns that are complete factory guns. Literally, I don't even know if they've done anything to them. And they're shooting, you know, sub-half MOA with the things. Um Let's talk about that for a little bit. Like, why didn't we go that route? I think maybe some of it was the enthusiast in us yeah. who enjoys building something. I know that's how I am. As much as I, when I get, for example, a um, custom built, not by me, AR-15 in my hand versus the one I built in my closet that I converted into a quasi-gun room, mm-hmm. uh, I just always think to myself, 
why do I keep building my own? Like, right. <laughs> this is so nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there's there's plenty of nice factory guns, so why didn't we go that route? Well, there, um, what would some good options out there be? Uh, yeah. Well, th- there is definitely something to say about something you put together, whether or not we actually, quote-unquote, build it. Um, but that taking all the components and putting them together into a functioning piece of equipment at the end um, does feel good when you're all said and done. Yeah. Um, but one of the main reasons why I kind of wanted to go this route with this gun was for the people who want customized features. Um, you get that barrel there. You can order it in a different twist. You can different different length. Um, so that's a big thing is being able to specify exact component specifications, not necessarily like, okay, I'm going to pick... Adhering to what a company factory says. Exactly, yeah. Whatever they choose to be what you need, this is us choosing what we want. Um, so the barrel length, the barrel twist, the barrel contour is all selected by us. Um, the muzzle brake, um, that is from Patriot Valley Arms. That is an amazing muzzle brake. Uh, extremely efficient, and it's self-timing, so we were able to screw that on the end of it, time it ourselves, and just tighten it down. Super simple. In fact, it's basically hand tight, and it's good enough. They're they're wonderful. Um, the chassis. This is from KRG. It's their Bravo chassis. It is one of their least expensive. However, uh, it's adjustable enough with that adjustable cheek piece, mm-hmm. and then having the ability to add on something like an Arca rail with preset bolt holes that are just ready to go. You just have to buy the the rail, set it on there, tighten it down. Just use the right screws, unlike I did. <laughs> well, I think that was on me, too. Um, we successfully well, made every easy job in building a rifle look extremely yeah, complicated. Yeah, it. I really hope when you guys are finished with that, that it is not full length because it'll be, <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll be extremely boring and uh, confusing and uh, embarrassing as You'll hell think for of me. Us but <laughs> with that arc or rail, though, I mean, the cool thing about that is. That could have been, I mean, you guys took that step now. You know, mm-hmm. you're saying, well, we could have, you know, spent a little less money and not gone with that, right? And you certainly could have, but that's also, if a person was going this route, something they could add down the road, too. Correct, yeah. You can put them onto a traditional style stock, too. It'll just require some drilling, um, yeah. and it's not a big deal. I've done, a, I've done quite a few of them, actually, but this particular chassis, as it sits, is already pre-drilled and everything. You just had to put that piece on there and bolt it on, and it was yeah. ready to go. Um, again, not a completely necessary piece, but one of the reasons why I like an Arca rail on there, not only can I just bolt it right to my tripod and shoot off my tripod, but as it sits, if I, you know, if maybe I'm shooting off of a rock that has, um, that's not very long on top. So I need to have my front and my rear stable points close together. I can slide that Arca all the way up to my magwell. I can slide the bipod right. all the way up there. Yeah. Or if I'm shooting prone, um, I... I have a good understanding of how much bipod I need. I can slide it all the way out to the end and then have the absolute most stable position I can get. So it's just very adjustable. Also, it gives you a wider flat base to place your bag on if you're going to be shooting with a front support bag like off of a cattle gate or off of, um, you know, really whatever you're going to be shooting off of. Uh, that does allow you a little bit wider base to work on. Yeah. And the and the the custom aspect of it and the ease of customization really is an attractive point to these because, like you said, I found myself in situations all the time where I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to get something... I'm going to get something that's relatively affordable, uh, and uh, this will be an easy way to get into something, right? Well, I get it, and I find, of course, in shopping around, and everybody knows, if if you're listening to this podcast, I can guarantee that you've been in this situation. There's the thrill to chase, right? You're chasing all over the internet. You're trying to find special editions of this, that, and the other thing. You're trying to find, you know, okay, I want this rifle, and I really like it the way that it is, but I wish it had a threaded barrel. Mm-hmm. Or I want it this way, but I really wish it was stainless. Or I really wish it had a lightweight contour. I wish it had this stock on it. And you're like, well, you know, no, I get it. like that stuff I can do later, right? And yep. you get it. And then you get it and you're shooting it for a little while. And then you think to yourself, it's just gonna keep bugging me if I don't yep. try it with that stock. Or mm-hmm. if I don't if I don't get the barrel threaded by somebody or if I don't get you know, and then all of a sudden next thing you know, you're taking the stock off and you're buying another stock. 
So then let's say you went with a $700 rifle to start with, right? Yep. Now, okay, you're thinking to yourself, huh, look at that idiot with a $2,000 rifle. He wasted all that money. I got this one that's just as good almost for $700. Right. Well, now you went out and you bought the $300 stock for it. And so then you have this other one laying around that you're not going to use anymore. And so, okay, now you're up to 1000 on it. And then you're like, okay, well, obviously I got to get an optic on there, you know. So then you get the optic and you get the rings. And then you're thinking to yourself later on, um, oh, man, I really wish I got the Arca Swiss. And then right. you get that. And, and ultimately you wind up customizing it to what you wanted in the first place anyway. Right. And you end up spending the same amount of money. And plus then you got a bunch of extra parts laying around that are taking up space that you're probably realistically not going to use, even though you tell yourself, oh, I'll keep that for right. that one rainy day. Everybody's got boxes of those at home. Right, and then you're like, well, maybe it'll grow into another rifle. And it's like, well, if you grow it into another rifle, that rifle is going to be just like the one that you got that you didn't like anyway. <laughs> um, so then you're going to customize that. So it just never gets used. Trust me on that. Just just try. Yeah. I just it's trust a, It's me. a wicked spiral, Jim, that it you're is. describing right It there. is. Because I've, the same thing happens with cars, right? So uh, anyway, but you wind up just kind of doing it anyway, right? Because yep. people want things the way they want it. And so I just like the fact that this and, and going with the, the remage style barrel, it makes, once you know the order of operations, it makes <laughs> barrel changes pretty seemingly simple looking. I mean, yeah. it's literally a barrel wrench. You just stick on there and loosen it up and you pull this barrel off. Um, because from what I've gathered, when I listen to the guys talk about competitive long range shooting, I'm amazed at how often they go through barrels. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, like, some of these real... If you're thinking of getting really into this, like some of the pros, I mean, once a season. I have... Well, actually, I have right now on my primary match rig, um, this is my second barrel this year. I got 650 rounds on it, and um, I have another barrel sitting on standby for when this one goes. And I probably won't get out of this barrel um, this year just because of how weird things was the scheduling with COVID and stuff like that, but... Uh, in a typical year, I'll go through three. Oh my gosh! How, what and what cartridge are you primarily shooting? Six Creed. Six Creed. Six yeah. Creed. Yeah. And I, I typically like to pull my barrel around fifteen hundred rounds. Fifteen hundred. Okay. You can definitely get more rounds out of a Six Creed more than that, but I never want to go during a match. Okay. Yeah. Why leave it hanging and you know oh, it might go any day now, well, and I have a really important match. Yeah, I and mean, you go to a, a national level PRS or NRL match, it might cost you up to a thousand dollars in in fees and travel and everything. So why chance it to a three hundred and fifty dollar barrel? I can just screw on. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, that's that that is the one thing that I really like about this. It makes it easier because if you get a rifle that's you know already factory built, maybe it doesn't have this nice barrel nut system like we have here or something like that that's really easy to change, then if you want to change that barrel, you're either getting specialty tools or you're sending it to a gunsmith. Mm -hmm. um, and when they put a new barrel on, it's going to be the same thing anyway, right? Unless you go, I don't know, unless you go, again, custom, and, yeah. you, and you wind up turning it into a custom rifle anyway. <laughs> well, a really interesting thing about this rifle is this... Again, is is really definitely a custom rifle because it is parts and components that we put together based on custom specifications. It truly is a custom rifle, even though it's not as awesome custom rifle as let's say Marks, but it is in the definition it is. And and like if you look at production division in let's say PRS, um, this falls way below the cost of like the what you would like the limits for a production division rifle in PRS. Hmm. I want to say it's like three or $4,000 for a production rifle. Oh, and, wow. And that's oh. because those production rifles can be made by a custom rifle maker. So, okay. I, 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 yeah, it's a fun one. That seems um, like a... But that seems like a... It's, as long a as that, you can go on and order that in the same way that you would be able to, like it's one that they have inventory, you can go on and order it, it's ready to go. Oh, okay. It is technically a production level rifle they as far as... They can make it perfectly and everything, <laughs> but they're technically right. a... Uh, yeah. GA Precision has one. Um, okay. They have uh, uh, Masterpiece Arms does one, uh, Patriot Valley does one, and they're all amazing rifles, and they are custom rifle grade but that fit into production division. Yeah. So, so here I am thinking to myself, like, well, maybe production, I could go in with the Ruger American. I You could. <laughs> I mean, it's, nobody's going to stop Nobody, you from yeah. doing it. Yeah. Um, but you know, you'll you be way more competitive on the field with this rifle than you would with an actual, well, I say actual production, but what I think most people think of a production rifle by a 
Tika Take one or uh, mass produced mm-hmm. somewhere around a grand. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, or RPR, which are fantastic rifles. Yeah. Um, there's uh, some guys out there right now shooting rear precision rifles that are just killing it. You know, putting the top ten at national level matches, which is amazing. Um, so it can be done. But if you need to get out and you want to be as competitive as possible, maybe boost your ego a little bit to go to your next match. You're, you know, to make take a real serious crack at it. This right here is a great way to go about it. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting point. What, uh, yeah, let's say just real quick though, for somebody out there who decides themselves, I really have no interest in just building my own. You know, mm-hmm. um, for those production uh, factory guns to get into something like that, what gun are you recommending them? I, I think there's, you listed a couple. Yeah, there's, there's, I think three primary ones that come to mind right now. That would be a Ruger Precision Rifle. Mm-hmm. They're fantastic. I've never seen seen one that doesn't shoot good. Um, the Bergara B14 HMRs, I think, are wonderful rifles. And um, Tika, I, I've, I got kind of a, a love relationship with Tika. I think that for the money, you cannot find a better factory action. They're mm-hmm. amazing. They're so smooth. They're great. And their it's, TAC A1 um, is yeah. right out the get-go. Um, the only thing I'd change really about their TAC A1, as soon as I get it, I, was, I put an arc array on the bottom of it because <laughs> I want a flat forend. But All right. Fair enough. Did we weigh Jim's gun? Um, no. I don't think we weighed either of them yet, did we? They're probably pretty close to the same weight. You Why know, is I, that? Because Mark's has a carbon barrel. Mm-hmm. What happened there? Well, your barrel is steel, but it is shorter. Um, oh, okay. Mark's is carbon, longer, and they put a weight in the forend. Mm-hmm. So where we did the trade-off, adding a carbon fiber barrel, I mostly did that for rigidity, although I did tell Mark it was to make it lighter. That was mostly so he'd still like me. Um, <laughs> that was mostly so he'd play along. <laughs> then, he, then he went and put a big weight in front of it. Mark was right. like, no, no, not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then we said, how about a carbon barrel? And he goes, oh, fine. fine. Well, sure, so carbon is an interesting thing, carbon fiber barrels, because you can take that barrel and with Mark's is essentially a full cylinder. I mean, mm-hmm. it has, if it has taper, it's not much. Um, and that barrel is, if you did a steel barrel the same length, same same, oh my gosh, uh, it'd be a tank. It'd be a, for one, it'd be a tank, but Oof. two, it technically would not be as rigid. Right. So, yeah, because it'd be made out of steel and, and, and it'd be longer. And yep. and yeah. Yeah. yeah, carbon fiber is a very rigid material. So we were able to add length, add rigidity, um, and decrease weight. So that weight decrease isn't necessarily a good thing because we did want to balance off the rifle. So in order to properly balance it, I did insert a weight into the forend. Mm-hmm. Um, and it did, I mean, just about a uh, half inch for the magwell, maybe an inch for the magwell was the balancing point, which is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I found that to be just absolutely, you know, I don't really plan on carrying that rifle a ton, but that balance point, you know, yep. and, and you were talking about how important that balance point is for shootability too. Oh yeah, yeah. If you're going to be using, if you're going to be shooting off of any odd, you know, um, whether it be I use a cattle gate all the time because that's probably my nemesis. But if you're going to be shooting off of a platform where you're going to be using a single point um, with like a, a bag or something like that, having that rifle properly weighted is huge. If you had a ton of weight in the rear, for instance, um, you'd be muscling it up to try to get it into position the whole time. Um, if you have a ton of weight in the front, you'd be kind of the same thing. You'd be trying to pull mm-hmm. that back end down, whereas you take Jimmy's rifle or your rifle and you take put that on a bag, on a prop or a barricade or a cattle gate or something like that, you could walk away from it and the rifle is going to sit there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to muscle in the position, which is one of the most important things with, with marksmanship, one of the fundamentals is uh, having a natural point of aim and developing a natural point of aim where you're muscling things on the target is really difficult to do. Well, and even, you know, natural rests like uh, the crotch of a a tree limb or, you know, know, you're getting prone over a rock or whatever you have that's going to provide, you know, a level of support to use as a rest, you know. I'm glad you said tree limb. Why? I was expecting, like, the crotch of your hunting buddy. (laughs) (laughs) That does a handstand. Don't shoot. Um... You know what? One thing, uh, we'll throw out this, speaking of hunting buddy and whatever, uh, the aesthetics. I was just about to get to that, Jim. Mm-hmm. Of uh, my gun versus Mark's gun. Now, here's the thing. Both are beautiful. Yeah. I think Mark's gun looks killer in that like black and kind of silver uh, color tone. I would just feel weird going out. We've Mark and I were discussing this. 
how awesome these rifles would be on an antelope hunt out in Wyoming or something like that, where you go in, yeah, sure, you got a little bit extra weight, but you find yourself the right spot, and you have a lot of capability with something like this. Um, you know, post up and and just kind of yeah, I mean, you're gonna your you're gonna be able to execute shots with a high level of confidence, and depending on the hunt or the mm-hmm. terrain or how far you're going, it may not be a big um, detractor to carry a gun that. That's exactly you know, as, heavy, as heavy as these are, and they're really not that heavy. I mean, no, no. I think, I, we're I talking think about they're in that ballpark of twelve to thirteen pounds. Yeah. Yeah. There's far heavier guns out there on the competition circuit. Oh yeah, um, Mark's is probably a little bit heavier than Jim's, just mm-hmm. because it does have a gen, Gentry razor on it. Yeah, but my uh, pause there earlier is because I was like, "Well, you set up the gun," then I was like, "Then what do I say? You don't lay waste. It's not like you then you just <laughs> fire away." <laughs> it's just, you, I'm like trying to think of the you know the hashtag, sort uh, hashtag <laughs> respect the animal. Yeah. Um, anyway, but send rounds <laughs> down range with reckless abandon. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's not what we're doing. No, hashtag that's not, not what all. we're doing. Mark's gun is beautiful though in the uh, for competition like kind of tactical, sort of just badass. Anybody who's ever seen a sniper movie or played mm-hmm. a video game with oh, it's long hot. range shooting, it's, you're like, oh, I want that one. It right? definitely has a very technological, futuristic yes. type of, um, you know, the Terminator could have been carrying yeah. that thing around or something, mm-hmm. yeah. If I were out on the countryside with it, I'd just feel weird. i just yeah. feel like it, something about it. No one's even around looking at you funny, but it's just like I'm walking around like, man, I feel like I'm walking around with like a laser gun. I mean, I call, like me, from Mars. call me a traditionalist, <laughs> but aesthetically it just seems somewhat out of place. Yeah, this, right. one, this one feels at home in both. Mm-hmm. Again, aesthetically, and some people may have different tastes. Some people may... Yeah. Have yep. no qualms, and in fact, realistically, and speaking, you shouldn't. There's in the no end, difference. In the end, it's not like I'm not going to go hunting. You know, I wouldn't at all go hunting with Mark's rifle, but it's just there was something about this one where I was like, I just would feel less funny going out with this thing uh, when I go hunting, and I also feel like it fits right in at, right. at a match. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it, and both would fit right in at a match, and I think uh, depending on. What guide or outfit are you using? Mike Marks might work too, but um, I would say most uh, most unguided hunts you'd probably look like a, a pretty interesting dude out there in the field with that rifle. But um, I yeah. kind of designed the components and everything about Mark's rifle to match something that I think would be like perfect for s- mammoth, mm-hmm. you know, like the Mammoth Sniper Challenge, where you need a a competition quality rifle. Um, where weight savings does matter. Okay, gotcha. You don't want it to be 25 pounds. Exactly. So your your rifle is set up the way it is because taking it to a PRS match or something like that, it would work wonderful. Um, it's probably a little bit too much recoil in its weight uh, as it sits. Um, I know, right? Because it, it, it doesn't move much. That non-existent <laughs> recoil is far too much. Yeah. It, it, um, the biggest thing is that it needed to be able to play in both markets really well. And uh, that's actually going to be a pretty sweet hunting rig, too, if you ever decide to take it. Cause oh, you certainly could. You know, and it's, it's interesting how, like, I mean, we're talking about this, and it's weird how you develop, I guess, like, what you picture as, like, you know, the purpose of a thing. Because it's, it's really, it's aesthetics. Like it's it like it's just an appearance. It's cosmetics. They both go bang. They're shooting the exact same cartridge at the exact same velocity, yeah. doing the yeah. exact same thing, nearly. You know, and uh, in the end, it's like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to take a gun out there that looks better for the situation, but doesn't shoot as good? And you're like, well, well no, I guess. Right. <laughs> right. Um, here's another thing I'll ask you, Nick. Um, I sort of know the answer in that we wanted it to be an even playing field. Uh, in, between the two, we both chose 6.5 Creedmoor for these. Why did we choose 6.5 Creedmoor for these? It's a great all-around cartridge. does a lot of stuff really well. Okay. Um, you can use it for competition. A lot of guys still do. Um, it's a great hunting cartridge. And um, Is it already becoming like kind of like eye roll in competition? Like, oh, 6.5 Creedmoor. Yeah, that came um, and went. No, you That's still, so uh, two years you ago. You still use that? Uh, if for the type of competitions I typically do, most guys are shooting 6 millimeters. Um, whether it be a 6 dash or 6 BR or 6 BRA, um, 6 GT. And it's mostly because they're very efficient cartridges that um, have very little recoil. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have 
in most cases, pretty heavy guns. Some guys still like lighter gun if they can, but the guns are pretty heavy. And, and the goal behind that is when I pull the trigger, I want to, for one, if I can see the trace, I want to be able to watch a bullet in flight to the target. Uh, two, when if, if I impact the target, I want to see exactly where on the target I impact it. Mm-hmm. And if I miss the target, I want to see how much I need to compensate to get myself on target. And being able to see all those things when the gun's moving around a lot after a recoil of a shot is very difficult. If the gun doesn't move at all, it's really easy to do. The, the more I've shot steel at some of these longer ranges, you know, and, and it's great. An impact is an impact, right? Mm-hmm. Got it. But being able to say... You know, oh, that was right edge of plate. Like, I barely clipped that thing. You know, if I want to give myself kind of, I guess, more of a margin of error, now I need to hold left edge of plate, yep. perhaps, or something mm-hmm. like that. So I'm centering that up. It really is interesting how important being able to spot those impacts it is. It is. Yeah. And it's it's mostly to, to just raise your percentages of hits. So, you know, if I have, um, if, if I hit the target, that's great. But being able to see where I hit on it so that I can put my crosshairs in a slightly different point to ensure that my percentage of those hits stay on. Because mm-hmm. I could keep on racking the bolt and keep on putting edge hits on there and they all count, but what if the wind changes a little bit and it takes yeah. me off the edge? No, mm-hmm. I just lost a point. Imagine being a basketball player and every time you shot a shot, you just closed your eyes as soon as the ball left your fingers. Oh, you don't do that? I do that all the time. Oh, well, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but I'm just thinking to myself, like, if that I... That actually ch- might improve my if I, odds. If right? I, yeah, me too. Well, <laughs> if, if I'm looking at the hoop and I chuck up a shot and then I close my eyes, and then from there on, it's just kind of like somebody else just tells me, oh, you missed it, or like, oh, you made it. It's like, it'd be kind of nice to know... Yeah. Where? How or where. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it, it it is pretty telling as soon as you do find yourself... You know, obviously compared to what we've shot in the past, Mark, I think you found and I found that these recoiled far less. It, it, to mm-hmm. me, it was, it was, I actually didn't even register it on my uh, internal Richter scale, but um, it was pretty evident when we were shooting that spinning target, for example, like 300 yards. Yep. Isaiah set up a spinner where, um, for those listening, essentially two steel plates. How big were they? Like, I actually don't know how big they were. If I had to guess, they were probably uh, a four inch on top and an eight inch on the bottom, but I yeah. could be wrong. Two steel plates and two steel plates on a spinner, and you shoot the one on the bottom. You get it moving a little bit, and then you got to shoot it as it swings back. You know, you're getting your timing up, the momentum of the swinger, and all this stuff. And then you you're got actually shooting at the spot before right. the plate gets to that spot, right? Yeah. With the end goal of, in the least amount of shots, getting it to go all the way around, right? And if you're shooting something like, uh, I don't know, I got one buddy out there who has this super high recoiling rifle chambered in a dumb cartridge that he won't get rid of. Um, But if you're shooting, you know, that guy's rifle, for example, uh, you'd be, I mean, it'd be, wait a minute. Boom. Oh, you'd be completely off the mark. (laughs) (laughs) It seems seems like, uh, do you know? Yeah, some? I think uh, I think I know the the person you're describing, Jim, and and uh, but I mean you are right. I mean with that boom. rifle, you aren't. You'd you know, to, you kind of look up and you go, "Did I get him?" Yeah, <laughs> you'd have to get back on the gun. You have to figure out where everything was again. You'd have to you know knock yourself back into today. And meanwhile, by then the dang thing is slowed down enough that it lost all of its momentum, and then you got to shoot it again and hope you know that eventually right. you can get it to spin around. Whereas when we were gone, it was like boom, and then you're already right back on the target again. You could you could hit it again and get keep that momentum rolling, right. which I found was like a super good exercise for just maintaining sight picture mm-hmm. and not moving so much after your first shot. It was a great exercise yeah it, it's um I, I think i think isaiah actually may have sold mark a, a 6.5 prc at home or down there just from you know some a little bit more science behind it but it's it's funny just how far cartridges have come over the years and how much more performance you can get out mm-hmm. of something that might not beat the crap out of you yeah now i'll say this though you if you uh if you hit that spinner on the first shot with this cartridge that you're describing, <laughs> you just need the one shot. If That's you can correct. be so lucky as to hit it. Yep. But yeah, the old, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is off topic, but the 6.5 PRC yeah. that Isaiah so eloquently. It sounds like it's got some interesting numbers attached to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, when you carry more energy at 1,000 yards than 300 Wisdom, I'm going to fact check it. 
<laughs> but I'm curious. <laughs> wisdom, 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 wisdom. But, you know, that was a good example, though. I mean, if you look at I'm shooting a six Creedmoor right now, which is a great cartridge. I'm a big six Comet guy. That six Comet, though, he's got his, you know, it's just a perfect example. He's just got a modified that six Absolutely BR <laughs> that is getting more performance out of that little cartridge and less recoil than my six Creedmoor. And it's just, you know, powder's getting better, bullets are getting better. Um, just the science behind case shape is mm-hmm. getting better. Um, and that's just a perfect example of it. You hardly know you're shooting that six Comet. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's dang efficient. I mean, he's shooting a 105 VLD at 3,050 feet per second. Um, out of a cartridge that is like the size of... Oh, it's cute. Yeah, they're adorable. It's cute. It's like one of those old... It's actually like, smaller than what I was about I mean, to describe like, it as. Full length with bullet, like that? Yeah, it ain't know. big. It's tiny. Yeah. I don't know. Find a picture of it. We should have uh, taken a picture we of should, it. Yeah, we we should have taken should've. a picture No, of I took a picture of it. We'll post it. We'll overlay okay, it or cool. something. Um, but, uh, yeah. Let's... Uh, Shall we talk about the optics a little bit? We didn't even talk about that much with Isaiah. Oh, we were so we, we were so uh, we were so caught up and uh, and mesmerized by him talking about all his gunsmithing. This one, we decided to put the Strike Eagle five twenty five by yep. fifty six on top, and honestly, can't think of a better rifle scope to do for this application and this idea. Uh, you know, you could throw. A, originally, I think I had like for. Uh, cosmetics and in, in my excitement of just getting it set up. I threw a dime back tactical first focal plane on there right away. Certainly uh, can do the job. I've done two vortex extremes with that now and uh, have no complaints. But hey, you know, I mean for a little bit more yeah. and with a ton more features, the strike eagle is Yeah. Oof, it was a nice. w- way more fitting scope yeah. for this setup. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. You know, for for your previous setup perfect match right like all those things kind of go together but this one this one man that scope is feature rich optically incredibly sound it tracks super true yeah the reticle is amazing like when i shot your gun i didn't feel like held back at all zero percent because of the optic no yeah and it's funny i mean like we talk about it and i i I almost i don't intend to undersell the razor gen 2 that was on your gun at all but like right when you talk about going from a rifle scope that costs 700 dollars to a rifle scope that costs two thousand dollars and you're going jumping back and forth between the two and when i got behind both of them it was never like this crap i gotta do all this readjusting or whatever dang i I can't see the target now yeah like (laughs) boy i sure wish i was still behind that razor getting behind the razor i do remember thinking to myself like oh yeah the razor it's like right it's like it's like falling into some really you know like comfortable bed it's just your eye is so relaxed and everything looks good uh but then i jumped back to the strike eagle and i was like well this is still great yep yeah no problem yeah, that is one of the things that I love about the Strike Eagle the most is that I have, uh, of the rifle scopes that I own, I have more Razor Gen 2s than anything else. And if I had, at a, at a glance, if you look at a Razor Gen 2 and a Strike Eagle, that Strike Eagle just looks like a black Razor Gen 2. So the guys that are really familiar with that particular optic... Be careful now. A lot of people ask for those. And I know, right? Someone's yeah. going to rip that out of context and say, <laughs> Nick Loffenberg from Vortex said black Razor Gen 2. They're clearly right. on, they're coming. But, you Still know, somebody only, who sorry. uses that optic picks up a Strike Eagle, for, especially for a training rifle, or they want something more budget-oriented that mm-hmm. um, still has similar features, has the same reticle. All the controls are the same. Yeah. Locking you have turrets. Locking turrets. You have a zero-stop mechanism. They both roll five-tenths past zero. Mm-hmm. The mechanisms themselves are different but they get the same job done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they both have illumination. One has a locking illumination, the other one's non-locking. Um, there's just... The the Strike Eagle's taking that, that Razor HD Gen 2 and taking all their features on there that are 10 out of 10 and making them 8 out of 8s to drop down the price. And so for somebody who wants to stick under $1,000, I don't think there's a better optic. They're amazing. Um, I have one on a... Um, a CZ 457 trainer, and I don't think I'd want to put a different optic on it. It just gets that job done as well as it possibly can. Mm. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, and then, you know, we chose the Razor Gen 2 for years because it only makes sense, you know, when you're doing, you know, you're going all out already on the gun. Mm-hmm. You should go all out on the optic. 
Uh, absolutely. And that, that Gen 2 Razor, I mean, you know, um, really, again, like, like Nick says, features-wise, on paper, not a ton of differences, but optically speaking, um, it just is, it's, it's that it's creme ju- de la creme. It's just a little, it's, a, it's got that little extra sweetness to it. And that's I'll kind of the common theme between, you know, the comparison when you compare these two rifles. Exactly. And actually, Jim, shockingly, you had a, a great car analogy. So maybe I'll just have you go into that with, uh, you don't remember your car analogy? I had a great car analogy at one point about that spinning target and pistons and stuff. Well, you were talking about like gas. essentially, uh, talking about? no, 91 versus 87 uh, octane gas. On the that was actually another fantastic one, but <laughs> not the one I'm talking about. Uh, you're talking about kind of like the Mercedes, right? Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Both these things, they'll, they'll pretty much get you to the same spot. Yeah. But the one just has a lot sweeter ride. Yeah. yeah. I've driven in a fast car that somebody hobbled together in their driveway, and it was like I got in, and it's like, okay, you know, this that's a little bit pokey. That, you know, it doesn't feel like it's on there super solid, but gosh darn it, when he pushes on the gas pedal, we go very quick. Yeah. And then you get in that fast AMG Mercedes, and it's like, we go very fast, and when I'm in here, everything is really like, man, plush. Now, this is not the hobbled together thing in the driveway like I'm describing. No, no. That's an extreme example. This Isaiah's is still nice. car analogy at the end, I actually really liked. He said, right here, you have a Ferrari pointing the Marks rifle, and then he says, right here, you got a pretty dang nice Camaro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Mark, you've been bringing up more car references than I have lately. That's so, crazy. Hey, if anybody out there is going to yell at us. Yell, yell at me. Mark, yell at Mark now. Jim's saying wisdom all the time. I'm talking about cars. Up is down. Cats are, <laughs> cats are chasing dogs. It's true. But uh, but actually, you do. there is also a parallel, too, with the rifles that we have here because what you see is the jump up in terms of cost from going from this rifle to a rifle like Isaiah built. You look at it and you think, that's a large sum of money that yeah, I just mm-hmm. jumped up. So you would think to yourself that you're going to jump up, you know, however, let's say that rifle costs 200% more than this rifle does. Some people might say, well, I'm going to get naturally 200% better performance. And it's like, to be really honest with you, probably not. And and when you jump up, for example, uh, in price from this Strike Eagle to that Razor Gen 2, you've jumped up more than 100% in price. Uh you don't get more than double the performance. No, it's it's. There's always these diminishing rates. You know, it is diminishing marginal returns. returns yeah. The law of diminishing returns. Yeah, yeah. You do as you get higher and higher in quality levels. Um, more it'll cost you more and more money to get you a smaller and smaller amount of quality. Mm-hmm. It just does. That's but how things work. Simultaneously, as you get more and more experienced, your level of ability to discern tiny differences in things grows. So, oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So, whereas I can't tell the stinking difference between an 8-ounce trigger and a 3-ounce trigger, Isaiah all day is going to be like, yeah, that thing's yep. heavy. You mm-hmm. know, or you even probably are going to be able to determine that, you know, and... and uh, well, little, as, as you get better and better and better, not only will you, may you discern those things, but those little things might incrementally improve your important performance like just that much yeah yeah like okay i've gotten myself to the point where i'm good enough that now this little minute thing that used to just be kind of like whatever i'll live with it it's actually the thing that's holding me back now yeah right well you were talking about earlier that the edge hit you know you're shooting the plate and you hit the edge of it well that's a hit but that gun might not shoot quite as well or might not be quite as consistent as that full custom build so that little margin of error could take you off the edge too so it's just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's just plain percentages you have you remove i think when he was talking about building his that rifle from mark was he was talking about getting everything down to absolute zero you know yeah. zero error zero error zero error and anytime you add one instead of a zero that just adds up and adds up and adds up and compounds and compounds and and you have these little little nuances that can decrease your percentage of hits and you know, the people that are at the top of their game, they want a piece of machinery that is going to be zero, 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 mm-hmm. zero all the way across the board. So it just comes back to the shooter. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I think is cool, like whether it's, you know, the, the gun Isaiah built or the, this gun here that you guys built, like they're both kind of purpose built for, I guess, you know, PRS, you know, competition, like long range shooting, right? Yeah. But certainly fits into that category. Well. It, it fits into that category, but it's certainly not limited to that. No, correct. And, I mean, long range is insanely fun, 
And oh yeah, you don't have to be in a contest. You don't have to, to be in a fun. contest or competitive shooter to enjoy or appreciate you know either of these rifles if you like to shoot. Mm-hmm. I wish more it's people fun. would put together bolt guns, uh, like they put together ARs. You don't see them as much, but you don't. No, I I, I would like to see more of it myself. I think um, there's something there's something to say about a precision rifle that is really interesting uh, yeah. when you when you get your first hit at you know, seven eight nine thousand when you first time you take somebody out and they hit a target a thousand yards i think they're that, that just changes their life they might as well it's run a four minute mile right yeah. <laughs> it just makes them feel good and uh being able to do that consistently though um is pretty special and something like this does it very well mm-hmm well, mm-hmm. and, and just hearing you guys talk about that process, I wasn't there for it. But you're like, oh, yeah, you know, a couple stumbles along the way. And, oh, wait, what's this part? Oh, we should have put that in 10 minutes ago. And, yeah. you know, doing a couple things twice. But, I mean, you guys essentially did the, the entire process one time. And just hearing you talk about it, you're like, oh, yeah, now if we did it again, it'd be like, boom, oh, boom, yeah. boom, boom, yeah. boom. You know? If we, we had all those components sitting here, we could probably throw that thing together in 10 minutes now. And I bet it would have come out even better than this one. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's it's worth doing. And uh, hopefully, maybe, after watching the video of it, after you know listening to uh, some of the stuff we talked about with Isaiah and that other podcast and this one, if you've been interested in doing this yourself, you know this, uh, this is something that people out there are going to want to try. That's kind of why we wanted to do this. I know we have a little bit more shooting to do with these things. That's mm-hmm. kind of the idea. We're yep. going to try and set up uh, a little bit of an obstacle course or borderline uh, competitive thing here where Mark and I can can test these things together, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So for that testing of the, I believe the plan is to still use the one forties. Um, right. That was the, Correct. both yeah, the, the guns shot grain ELD match. Yeah. Both these guns shot that really well. And, and that's something that, you know, we kind of touched on a little bit before the guy who's going to be setting up this rifle, um, might just want to do it just because of all the, um, you know, the different parts that he can specify. Like I want a one and seven or a one and seven and a half or one and eight twist. I want 26 inches. I want it, uh, an M24 or in this case, a, a varmint contour. Reloading is another really important thing. This rifle shot, you know, about three tenths of a minute. Uh, if I were to take the same rifle and do a little low development, I can make that group shoot a little bit better. Um, however, you know, I take an, an, a rifle like Isaiah built just because it's a little bit better in every way, shape, or form, it's going to get that little bit of better performance even with that too. So that's just a, an important thing to keep in mind. This one takes a little bit more work, but you also have that completed product that you got to put together yourself and, and mm-hmm. finish up. And you learn so much about how stuff works when you do it yourself too. Sure, you absolutely. Know, I didn't know a lot of stuff about how these things all went together, you know, when I was just buying factory guns that were already made, you know. Mm-hmm. And then also listening to Isaiah and him talking about how important certain things were with – you know, mating the barrel to the receiver and whatnot. So if you're really into this stuff and you really like it and you like tinkering on things and seeing how it all works, I think this is this is something you should totally try. You know, maybe yeah. maybe uh, decide not to build that 8th, ninth, 10th AR. Can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> uh, and, and decide to try building a bolt gun. Uh, good times. Yeah, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. And uh, it kind of makes me want to do another one myself. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, with that said, stay tuned. I think we might even do yeah a little bit more video stuff. Who knows? But uh, thanks, everybody, for listening out there. Let us know what you want to hear, too. So these pod ventures are for you. Uh, as much as it seems like we're having a ton of fun, which we are, yep. uh, we're doing it, hopefully, to help uh, empower a lot of you out there to get out there and try something, break out of your comfort zone a little bit, learn something new. That's all good stuff, right? So. Yeah. Um, yeah, let us know what else you guys want to be seeing. Uh, if it's anything else you want to see us do with these rifles or questions you have about how these rifles came together, how they came to be, whatever, uh, we'd love to answer those. We got Nick here. He's in house all the time. We can answer those too. So hit us up on the Instagram page at Vortex Nation Podcast or in comments uh, on YouTube. So nailed it. Did we do awesome. It? All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.